If uh, you want to follow along this evening, if you would turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And I believe uh, what we're going to be looking at is encapsulated in, in this text, verses 3 through 6. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 6. John, uh, by the inspiration of the Spirit, writes this, beginning in verse 3 of chapter 2. And by this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps His word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in Him. The one who says he abides in Him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Now again, as we uh, saw last week, this, this one passage, these few verses already make the case. There really isn't any reason to say anything more, although we are going to look at some other things just to try to fortify this. But the point is that if we are true believers, we will obey the Lord. And we will not just do it outwardly, we will do it inwardly. We will do it out of a motive of love. The two things have to be there, uh, and they work, of course, hand in hand. Now, uh, as you know, Edwards has been bringing us systematically to the climax of what really is a sermon. Everything that Edwards wrote, maybe with the exception of the, uh, of the uh, freedom of the will, was, was really a sermon. And perhaps that was too. It was more of a philosophical treatise, I suppose, the uh, freedom of the will. But the, the purpose of this was to, um, to communicate to God's people the things they needed to know for their eternal well-being so that they would not be deceived. And also, I think in the case of the religious affections, to be able to vindicate the uh, great awakening as a genuine work of God's Spirit, trying to sort through what those things were produced that uh, were of the Spirit, and those things that, that were not, that were counterfeits of the enemy or things by which the enemy was seeking to lead God's people astray. But in developing this topic, Edwards has shown us that uh, true and saving grace is certainly rooted in the affections. Christianity is first and foremost a matter of the heart. I think we understand that by now. That in saving conversion, the Holy Spirit produces love, which is the holy root from which all the other fruits grow, and really, literally, all the other fruits, including faith, repentance, and every, everything you read in, in the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And that this love, this affection, is not a weak love that barely moves us beyond the level of indifference, if you can picture that, sort of like, um, you know, picture a ball that's at rest and a breeze comes against it and barely moves it. You know, it's not like that. It's rather like a swift kick, you know, that gets that thing really going. It's a strong affection, okay? That this affection is a foretaste of heaven, which is a world filled with this kind of love in all of its intensity, and that fills the hearts of those who are there uh, from the fountain and source who was there. That's what makes heaven heaven, by the way. It's not all the golden... You know, all the, all the imagery we read about the golden streets and city and so forth and all the things that we might desire in this world that, that are valuable, uh, that's probably symbolic language anyway. It's, it's the fact that God is there and that He is the source of love and He fills us with that love, which is the Spirit of God to the point where our hearts are going to burst. But this love the Spirit of God puts in our hearts here and now is the foretaste of heaven, what we will enjoy there forever. That this explains why the Lord has commanded the kind of worship that he has in his church. Remember a little ways back there that Edwards told us that God doesn't have a stand and, and recite you know, the, the scriptures necessarily uh, or scriptural truth, but he has us sing it. You know, we, we lift it up with music because it stirs the affections. And that he doesn't have his ministers just simply read the word of God, although we do that and that's important, but also to preach it in a way that is, that is geared towards stirring the affections and moving us in a particular direction, hopefully Godward and, and in no other direction. That this is what the means of grace do. They actually strengthen our love for the Lord because they are so many means uh, by which the Lord conveys to us uh, the ministry of His Holy Spirit to increase our love 
for Him and our affection for Him. And remember what Edwards means by that. Not just love for God because of what He gives to us, but love for God for who He is and particularly for His holiness. The Spirit of God gives us love for holiness. That this love will also strengthen our conviction that the Bible is true because it opens our eyes to something that is there, but, but the person who is unconverted is blind to and he can't see, and that is the glory of God and against the glory of that holiness. And as we see that, and as we see that, of course, in the Lord through the eyes of faith, it convinces us these things are true, and so it again stirs up our hearts and moves us in a Godward direction. And that it will do these things as well, and I'll mention them just briefly, that it will humble us, continually transform us into new creatures made in the image of Christ, give us tender hearts, spiritually balanced lives, you know, we're not just, you know, super zealous in one area and completely neglectful in another. Give us a hunger and thirst for communion with God as we were praying earlier. The desire to obey all of God's commandments, which we're looking at now. An undivided heart in our service to the Lord. And the desire, and with that desire, the ability to endure to the end of our lives in holiness, no matter what opposition we may have to face in this world. So that's a summary, basically, of what we've seen in the religious affections. I've skipped the part where it talked about the things that may or may not indicate that we're believers to just summarize those things that do. Now his final point is this that we were looking at last week. Everything that God does in our hearts, all the effects of the Spirit of God, all conspire to do one thing, and that is to produce the fruit of good works. That is why the Lord saved us, that we might be zealous for good works. That is why He gave us His Holy Spirit, to produce a love for Him that we might do good works. And as we saw last week, this is how others will know that we are genuine believers. Jesus says in John 13, 35, By this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Now we're reaching the final point, believe it or not, in, in the uh, religious affections, but it is such an important point that Edward spends a good deal of time on it, so we'll look at this perhaps for the next couple of weeks, but we do want to break ground on it, on it to, uh, tonight. Uh, and that is this, that not only will others know that we are genuine believers by our works, but we will know it as well. Now, as I've said, we're going to consider it or break ground on it this evening by considering two things. First of all, the Lord clearly tells us in His Word, I mean, we've already seen it, that our good works will show us that we are genuine believers. But, secondly, we do need to understand what kind of good works He is talking about. It's not just any good works that are formally good, we might say, but those that are motivated by love and, of course, a desire to give glory to God. So first of all, the Word tells us that our good works will show us that we are true believers. So we've already seen this in our text this evening, 1 John 2, verse 3. By this we know that we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. Uh, I believe, let's see if it was at our meditation, yeah, it was our meditation this evening in, in 1 John 3, verses 18 through 20, he writes this, Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but indeed in truth. We will know by this that we are of the truth and will assure our hearts before Him in whatever our heart condemns us. For God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now what John is saying here is that the fruit of our lives, not just the thoughts that we think, not just the words that we speak, and not just the expressions of concern that we may give to other people. Uh, those things are indicative, but if that's all there is, that's not enough. Actual obedience, that is the fruit of these things, if these things are genuine, is enough evidence to overthrow any doubts that our hearts or our conscience may bring against us that we are not the true children of God. It has that much power, evidential power in our lives. The author to the Hebrews points to the good works of his audience for the evidence of their conversion. First of all, he says to convince him, himself, that they are genuine believers. He says in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 9 through 10, 
But beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust so as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and in still ministering to the saints. You notice the author to the Hebrews says, because of that we are convinced of better things concerning you, better than the things that he had mentioned, which is those who have tasted of the heavenly gift, made and made partakers of the Spirit, and have fallen away. We're convinced of better things concerning you because of the evidence of your lives. But then he goes on to say that this evidence will also convince them that they themselves are genuine believers in verses 11 and 12. He says, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. You see, as they show the same kind of diligence as these others that we're convinced that they're, they're born again, that they will realize that same assurance, that full assurance of hope. They will assure themselves that they are genuine believers. Jesus says the same to his hearers in the Sermon on the Mount. First of all, the good works are the rule by which we should judge the confession of others, whether they are genuine believers. Matthew 7, verses 18 through 20. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Can't get much clearer than that. But he also goes on to say that these good works are the rule by which they would know or that, that men would know or that we would know that we are genuine believers in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. You see, if you do the will of the Father, then you can know that you are going to be one of those who enter into heaven. You will fear, he says, neither the adversities of this life nor the judgment on the last day at the very end of the Sermon on the Mount when he says, therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Do you want to know that your life will not cave in and fall, that you won't be destroyed? Then act upon Christ's words. Do what he says. Build your house on the rock. That means you listen and you do what the Lord says. So good works are the evidence. If you see yourself doing that, then you know that your house will stand. It will endure the adversity of life. It will endure the final judgment. Now that's, I think, fairly clear, that good works are strong evidence, but Edwards wants to add, of course, a, a modifier here, a caveat that we need to make sure we understand what kind of good works we're talking about here. That it's not just anything good that we may do. They have to be good works with a particular motivation, and that motivation is, of course, love for God and a desire to give Him glory. So first, what do Jesus and the apostles mean when they say that good works are strong evidence that we are true believers? Well, they're not talking about right actions divorced from right motives for doing those things. I hope we, we see the difference there. Edwards tells us that men's actions apart from their motives, or at least uh, from the right motives, quote, are no more good works or acts of obedience than the regular motions of a clock nor are they considered as any human actions at all. The actions of the body taken thus are neither acts of obedience nor disobedience, any more than the motives of the body, or excuse me, the motions of the body in a convulsion. But the obedience and fruit that is spoken of is the obedience and fruit of the man, and therefore not only the acts of the body, but the obedience of the soul consisting in the acts and practice of the soul. In other words, he says, you take the motives along with the actions. We do need to realize that even unconverted people can do, at least outwardly, good works. 
certain what we call, you know, uh, well, at least what uh, John, John Gerstner called bad good works. <laughs> okay? Bad good works. Now, our confession tells us that it's possible for unbelievers to do bad good works. It says this in Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 16, verse 7. Now, listen carefully. Works done by unregenerate men, although for the matter of them, they may be things which God commands, and of good use both to themselves and others. Yet, because they proceed not from a heart purified by faith, nor are done in a right manner according to the word, nor to a right end the glory of God, they are therefore sinful and cannot please God or make a man meet to receive grace from God. And yet their neglect of them is more sinful and displeasing unto God. Now what that means is that people can go through the motions. They can do outwardly the things that are required. But what they do is not truly pleasing to the Lord because of the motive for which they are doing it. I mean, there are great acts of sacrifice. Think about 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul says, you know, I can, I can give all my possessions to the poor, I can give my body to be burned, and hopefully, that, I, mean, I would assume that means in a good cause and not just, in a, you know, just to burn yourself to ashes. But I can make these great sacrifices of all I possess and even my own life, which may be good in their context, but if I don't have love, if I don't have the right motive, it doesn't profit me anything because it is not pleasing to God. It is a bad, good work, if you get the, the point there. The Lord does not consider our works to be good at all if there is no good motive behind it. If we programmed an ATM machine, for instance, to distribute money to the poor, you know, what, what the ATM machine does is not necessarily praiseworthy because it doesn't have a motive in doing what it does. It's just simply going through the motions. Neither would we say that someone is obeying Christ merely because he is doing something Christ commands when, as a matter of fact, the person has never heard of Christ and doesn't love Christ and doesn't love God. Just doing the outward action is not enough. You must have the, the inward motive of love and a desire to give glory to God. Edwards writes this, If the acts of obedience and good fruits spoken of be looked upon, not as mere motions of the body, but as acts of the soul, the whole exercise of the spirit of the mind in the action must be taken in with the end acted for and the respect the soul then has to God. Otherwise, they are no acts of denial of ourselves or obedience to God or service done to Him, but something else. Such effective exercises of grace as these, many of the martyrs have experienced in a high degree and all true saints live a life of such acts of grace as these, as they all live a life of gracious works, of which these operative exertions of grace are the life and soul. And this is the obedience and fruit that God mainly looks at, as He looks at the soul more than the body, as much as the soul in the constitution of human nature is the superior part. As God looks at the obedience and practice of the man, he looks at the practice of the soul. For the soul is the man in God's sight. For the Lord sees not as man sees, for he looks on the heart. I hope you see the point there. It's, it's the heart that the Lord is looking at, not just the action. The, the soul is the man. The practice of the soul is the practice of the man, not necessarily what he is doing outwardly. So good works motivated by love for God are the kind of good works that are the evidences of genuine grace in our souls. And this is what Christ and the apostles were referring to in the quotes that we looked at before. When Jesus tells us at the end of the Sermon on the Mount that those who listen to his words and act upon them are true disciples, he has in mind, of course, everything that he referred to in the sermon, including, of course, what takes place at the very beginning when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the gentle, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the poor in heart, blessed are the peacemakers. For the most part, these things are, are things that take place inwardly. He's referring to those who aren't angry at their brother without cause, to those who aren't looking upon others to lust after them, 
those who love their enemies, those who seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. In other words, it's not just the external actions, but it's also a matter of the heart. Those who are doing the kind of works the Lord requires do it with their soul as well as with their body, with the right motives. When John tells us in our text, 1 John 2, 3, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments, he is talking about that kind of obedience that comes from a heart purified by faith and motivated by love as we continue to read in the chapter in verses 5 and 6. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So the one who keeps his word, who assures himself that he is of the truth, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. And when we walk according to the commandments the way that the Lord Jesus Christ walked, then we know that we are in him. And of course Jesus in his obedience didn't give just merely outward obedience, but rather gave his father the obedience of his heart and soul. In verses 7 through 11, we again see the inward motive coming out for the works that tell us that we are genuine believers. Beloved, I am not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you have heard. On the other hand, I am writing a new commandment to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The one who says he is in the light and yet hates his brother is in the darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. The point being again that this obedience by which we have come to know him, the keeping of his commandments can only truly be known. If we are loving our brethren, then we are abiding in the light. Then we are doing the works uh, that, that God requires. Then we are fulfilling the heart and soul of the commandments. It's not merely to do these things almost like automatons or robots with our hearts disengaged or even with hatred in our hearts, but rather with love in our souls, both toward God and toward man. And when the scripture tells us that we will be judged according to our works on the last day, again, he doesn't mean merely by the things we've done, but also by the motives. He says through Jeremiah the prophet in Jeremiah 17.10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. Now, the Lord wouldn't have to search the heart if all he had to do was look at the external man. Oh, you're doing what's right, therefore you're acceptable. That's not what the Bible says. The Lord says he searches the heart and the mind because he is looking at the soul behind what's going on there, the soul of that action, the motive behind it. When Hezekiah pled with the Lord to lengthen his life, he didn't just plead his life of obedience before the Lord, but also his heart behind it. In Isaiah 38, verse 3, Remember now, O Lord, I beseech you, how I have walked before you in truth and with a whole heart and have done what is good in your sight. Didn't just walk before him in truth and do what is good, but he says, I have done this with my whole heart. In other words, look at my soul and see that my motive was right. Good works are the evidence that we are saved but only if they come from a heart that is charged with love for the Lord. That is the kind of good works that uh, or the good, yes, the good works that are the evidence that we are genuinely converted. Now one final point is this. We mustn't forget that though, well, that our motives are important. They, though our motives are important, our actions are also important, okay? In other words, we don't want to emphasize our works to the exclusion of our motives. But on the other hand, we don't want to argue, argue our motives to the exclusion of our works. They're both important. Okay. It isn't enough to want to do the right thing. We also have to do it. Does that make sense? Edwards writes this. Thus, it would be ridiculous for a man to plead 
that the commanding act of his will was to go to the public worship while his feet carry him to a tavern or brothel house. Or that the commanding act of his will was to give such a piece of money he had in his hand to a poor beggar while his hand at the same instant kept it back and held it fast. Okay. It isn't enough to have the motive. You see, the motive has to be strong enough to work itself out in action. We can't claim to be Christians just because we want to do what is right. The evidence that we are born again uh, by the Spirit of God is that we do what is right with a right heart. So may the Lord grant that that is what we'll find within ourselves. Good works that are motivated by a heart of love, not just you know the works without the heart, going through the motions as the hypocrites do, as the Pharisees did, you know, trying to clean the outside of the of the, of the uh, well of the sepulcher in this case, so the outside of the cup without cleaning the inside of the cup. Jesus says, clean the inside first, and then the outside will become clean as well. But on the other hand, not just thinking that the inside of the cup is clean, while the outside is still remains unchanged. We have to have both. And both are only possible through that work of the Holy Spirit within our hearts. And so as we examine our hearts, may the Lord grant to us that we would find both the soul of these good works as well as the good works themselves. Well, let's uh, bow for a few moments of silent prayer and ask the Lord to search our hearts.